Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the organizers first, and of course, in particular, John, for inviting me here. <clears throat> um, let me uh, mention that this paper discusses how provincial governments can actively play a developmental role in economic transformation by examining the role of Penang in Malaysia. <clears throat> um, I would like to mention that the political economy origins drove Penang to assume a proactive role to target MNCs. Initially, in, an, uh, in uh, employment generating activities and subsequently in technological upgrading activities. And the focus here being on the integrated circuit. I'd like to mention a few things before I go on to th this slide. One of which is I subscribe to the World Bank book that came out in 1980 uh, by Bussing, uh, among others, uh, that make the point that given the context of Malaysia, um, although Malaysia's growth cannot be seen in the same light as Korea and Taiwan, or even Singapore, but to them, growth with equity was pertinent to, to prevent any political crisis. And this is a position Frances Stewart takes when she refers to horizontal uh, inequalities by saying that unless the problems of the majority are met, um, if the government didn't take the position of supporting them, that's the boom putras. Uh, people who are considered to be the sons of the soil, although in real meaning it, it really refers to the Malays, then you could have had maybe uh, the balkanization of Malaysia. <clears throat> and the second point I'd like to make is, um, is uh, just to contrast the position I took. I'm not really <laughs> clashing or colliding with the views of Justin Lin, uh, because his point of of catch up was more in relation to income. Uh, when he was referring to Korea against uh, Japan, Korea had a per capita income of 30% of Japan, and that was proximate. But of course, many of us have different understanding of Gershon Kron. I have from the 1952 work of his rather than the 1962 one. Uh, now, I'd like to say that, that somehow Weblin to me comes out more significantly because I'm a technology man. having study technology by being in firms, including Intel and advanced micro devices. So I see Weblin's work blending, even though he takes a very sociological position, and like me, I don't have a sociological uh, background in terms of a disciplinary specialization, uh, or even Gershenkron. And he embraces also Schumpeter's notion of, of innovation. And here I'd, I'd, I'd like to mention that there is where you find um, uh, those recent works, say, of uh, Kyun Lee and others who make the point that Samsung actually caught up much faster than the incumbent that it overtook in memories, um, um, Hitachi, which subsequently became smaller uh, into, say, uh, Renaissance. Or for that matter, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company in, um, in Logic Chips. It's, these are two firms that actually reduce the minimum line weight, and I also focus on extending the diameter of the wafer, the two dimensions that we consider as paramount when you look at uh, frontier innovations in, in integrated circuits. Of course, microprocessors still remain with Intel. Now, I take that, that sort of point, and at the same time, I also use the methodology that was, uh, to me, pioneered by Nathan Rosenberg, Nat and uh, Carl Damon, among others, and subsequently uh, worked by others in identifying capabilities. And that's how I came up with this stylized framework. In the past, firms tended to specialize in each of these different activities in a more or less U-shaped um, uh, value chain. This original one that I saw was actually uh, produced by the UNCTC, which doesn't exist now. United Nations uh, Center for Transnational Cooperation, uh, Carl Sowan used to run that. What has happened now is you see extensive innovation. To be in this industry, there must be huge amounts of innovative potential. You're not talking about um, a comparable sorts of um, uh, firms that may simply focus on, on labor-intensive activities. We can't talk about the production possibility frontier where firms have an option, depending on the kind of human resource that they have, to choose between labor-intensive or capital-intensive industries. This is not possible at all if you are in this industry. Uh, the dimension of technology evolves so much, it's simply not possible. And the second thing is, at all segments of the chain, you see enormous amounts of in in innovation. I consider R&D support if, say, innovation is targeted assembly and test activities. 
In fact, much of what happened in Penang, I will discuss later, began that way, before initiatives were taken to, to broaden the value, value chain. <clears throat> so I consider us upgrading so long as the firms are upgrading in the same segment by introducing supportive R&D, or moving leftwards to do wafer fabrication, which is an expensive activity that also functions as an anchor activity, but most of the uh, appropriators of the synergy are the chip designers, um, who tend to be higher in that sense. And they, they are not as scale intensive as wafer fabricators, but they are um, um, also very highly uh, knowledge intensive. <clears throat> Now, in terms of the methodology, I've actually interviewed all the firms here. So it's the, uh, the only thing I didn't do is to get their sales, uh, sales figures directly from them. But we have figures from Gartner for each of these individual firms, but at the whole uh, microcosm rather than the individual subsidiary, because it was not really possible to get that sort of data. But we have some figures that can be used. <clears throat> Penang's, the MNCs in Penang, again, when we're talking about value chains here, even though there are some firms that contract that are nationally owned and, and they act as uh, uh, subcontract manufacturers, but much of the chain here evolved through multinationals. One has to understand that uh, Penang has uh, a dominant Chinese community. And in fact, the, the political party that won at that time uh, was led by Lim Chong Yu, Chinese community. And because the federal government lost its majority, it actually bargained with this uh, which state uh, chief minister then to come in and he used as a bargaining point to be able to negotiate with MNCs independently of the federal government. So here I was actually knocking the doors of Hewlett Packard, Intel, Advanced Micro Devices and others and attracting them to Penang, the only state that enjoyed that sort of autonomy. The focus then was on generating employment because the state was classified as among the poorest states in Malaysia at that time. Now what I would like to show is how the state managed to become the second richest state Largely, a lot of it internalized through networking between the multinationals, um, the state government and its agencies, as well as the meso organizations that it had control over or it could create. Uh, it did not have the capacity, even now it doesn't have, to provide grants. That's a federal issue. <clears throat> and then, in that sense, um, the, the links also meant, because the state was conscious that its own performance highly relying on how successful it will be, it actually established collaborative relationships. And I had the opportunity to, to work with them from 1985. In fact, I used to know the chief minister too, which, which helped considerably. But at the same time, they also had information flows from the firms to the state officials. It was around that time there was a massive amount of changes taking place in these firms. Uh, firms were automating, but largely because of volatile fluctuations in demand. It was pointless to have large inventories. Uh, the introduction just in time was, was very crucial, and that actually helped them transform, and that also drove the kind of machinery they introduced, and the fact that they had to train workers to become more, more innovative. <clears throat> I'll come back to that if you have questions. And then because of the fact that, that skills were very important, instead of firms internalizing these activities, they actually participated collectively to start the Penang Skills Development Center in 1989. I'll, I'll discuss this later, but the important point here is that, that it was a, a manifestation of collaboration between the three partners. <clears throat> Strategic networking established over the period since the 1970s saw the Penang government using the Alliance of Cooperation to influence the federal government to offer grants to MNCs since 2005. In fact, that's the link with the state government used in order to ensure that, say, Intel, one of the firms that threatened to leave. In fact, they, uh, they had just started the plan in Vietnam then. <clears throat> and then subsequently to, to start the Penang Design Center. <clears throat> this is a framework that I use um, and uh, that I accessed in talking to all of these people, uh, including the CEOs of companies, as well as the agency in the, in the uh, federal government, uh, METI, that is, instrumental in providing grants. Officially, it was announced in 1991, they only gave national firms these grants until 2005, after which they gave uh, grants upfront to attract wafer fabrication and designing centers. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, 72 to 92, you had this phase uh, where employment and exports 
grew rapidly. Exports has continued to grow by employment has fallen gradually since because the industry had become very knowledge intensive. Labor shortages and gradual removal of financial incentives against newly emerging sites resulted in a contraction of employment, but exports continued to rise. A number of firms upgraded from assembly and test to designing R&D as new firms relocated wafer fabrication activities since the 1990s. Intel and so on expected this to happen because of the, of the grant the government announced in 91. So they already started that, but they didn't enjoy the grant until 2005. This is the pattern you have, exports and employment. This is for, the, for Malaysia, but if you look at exports, about 75% of exports come from Penang. Uh, and, most, and in terms of employment, it's about only 51% of employment is in Penang. That all shows that in, in Penang, they become a lot more capital intensive and knowledge intensive. <clears throat> These are the firms that are there, all of them. Advanced Micro Devices, Altera, Ace, which is Taiwanese, <clears throat> uh, Wago Technology, Singaporean, Fairchild. It was originally National Semiconductor. When Fairchild went down, they acquired the name and changed themselves to uh, Fairchild. Uh, Globetronics, which is a national firm. Uh, Hewlett Packard, I put a star there because they're no longer in semiconductors. They are not there as a result. They have uh, uh, migrated out to a different uh, segment of electronics. Infineon, uh, which acquired one uh, a segment of uh, Siemens semiconductors uh, technology, Intel, two different plants, one focusing on assembly and test, the other on designing. Integrated device technology, uh, Marvel technology, Osram, Renesas, they all what remains of Hitachi, and Siltera, which is a national firm focused on fa uh, wafer fabrication. Actually, that firm is actually the, the worst performer in relation to revenue. It is still the worst performer um, in the last Gartner uh, report. <coughs> Now, let me mention that the chief minister's initiative was quite central, I think, also because he twice almost uh, got defeated by, by the opposition, who simply came out with the idea that these multinationals were sweatshops uh, uh, treating Malaysians as downtrodden humans. And he took the initiative to see that suppliers uh, evolved, but because it coincided with multinationals' initiative to, to stimulate proximate sourcing, because it helped them fabricate machinery, stamping, um, um, uh, milling, and, uh, uh, as well as participation in precision uh, tooling activities, led to the form uh, uh, development of several suppliers. I mentioned in the, in the paper something like 400 over suppliers. Some of them became um, global service uh, providers. And then the, the original role played by the uh, Free Trade Zone Penang um, um, Association, where they are, the role here really brought captains of the different um, uh, stakeholders together where they solved problems of power failure, infrastructure, customs. That led to collaboration that went on to, to, uh, to support uh, training, uh, supplier activities, and so on. Promotion of local suppliers, as MNC sought proximate supply. In fact, I'd like to credit myself on this because I, I discovered that happening in multinationals and brought this information to state officials. Um, you can, you can actually uh, get back to some of them who are still alive, some of them no longer alive. Uh, <clears throat> and then the establishment of collaboration with the University of Science Malaysia. In fact, the programs, particularly related to engineering and IT courses, um, Intel officials, Motorola officials, uh, and many other company officials uh, often sit to, to fine tune them in line with what industry wants. Then you see the establishment of PSDC. The Penang Skills Development Center, the state began that by actually charging a, a whole entire uh, building that they had occupied earlier, one ring it a year as rent. Um, um, that's their contribution to an organization that they saw as a public good, uh, production of public good, meaning a good that was non-rivalrous and non-excludable, uh, very key to the state's uh, development. In return, the state required that a certain proportion of of the labor force be trained and trained free. <clears throat> Coordination with federal government to renew incentives, 1985. Um, in fact, at that time, the, the, the Malaysian government had its uh, second uh, uh, negative GDP growth rate. And they were under the Tun Mahathir's administration, they were keen on building national, national capital then. And because of that, uh, they decided to renew these incentives. And then the grants in 2005. 
establishment of Penang Development uh, uh, Design Center, they have a um, clean room, RFID, uh, radio frequency um, 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 lab now, which is there to help, uh, especially small firms that require um, um, such machinery and equipment and, and the clean room to do their testing. <clears throat> I, I can actually uh, discuss this if you have questions, because um, um, this relationship is a very strong one where a former uh, vice president of Intel himself was instrumental in the creation of several uh, spin-offs, a number of which are still uh, existing. And this could be a model that others can use when you have problems, uh, how a state government can actually come forward and, and play a more dynamic role. In making this point, I take this Dick Nelson sort of evolutionary view. In that sense, I, I then would defer from, say, Gershon Kron, or David Teese, among others, or Sidney Winter. They, they make the point that it's not just the initial conditions that matter. It's how the actors themselves respond to those conditions and how the vision that they take to transform um, um, the, the structural conditions of a location that matter. And in that, in that sense, these initiatives took Penang to a certain height, took, took Penang to a point where they were able to enjoy high uh, value-added growth, high per capita incomes, but not sufficient to, say, participate in the frontier activities. I would also make the same point in Singapore. Singapore is in a much higher uh, um, structure if you looked at the capability framework that I developed. But there are, there are no semiconductor firms in Singapore that actually create new stocks of knowledge comparable to the type I defined as the ones that shape the frontier, meaning minimum line width and the diameter. Uh, as you would see in Taiwan, the logic chips uh, uh, industry is um, um, completely dominated by TSMC, while memories is by Samsung. They are quite far ahead. And I also would like to mention that one of the big benefits that you got from here, not appropriated significantly by the Malaysian government, again, if we take the Francis Stewart sort of argument, growth with equity or the World Bank argument, that's the position they, they, the, the, the most they can meet in order to avert, say, a political crisis. But that also means that it limits them from moving to the next stage to be a Korea or a Taiwan, um, simply because the entrepreneurs themselves, Globetronics, for example, is nationally but Chinese capital owned, and therefore they, they haven't enjoyed the sort of grants to be able to make the same sort of leap in moving to R&D activities such that actually Globetronics has their subsidiary plan in Singapore because they got the grant in Singapore. Um, I could also mention the number of Malaysian Chinese who are in Taiwan. Um, the inventor of the pen drive, um, who's now a billion dollar firm, is a Malaysian himself. And so these are constraints that you have to face. But if you take the logic of growth with equity, that's all they could, they, they could achieve. <clears throat> but the important point here is if Korea and Taiwan attracted back the diaspora, um, leading firms run by that, including Samsung, uh, Huang's law that we have in memory, which the, the, the minimum line width halved in every 12 months. This is again something that went against Moore's law. And the chip uh, transistor density doubles. Huang himself started um, um, his own firm in 1973, but it went bust in 75 uh, under the heavy, and industry, uh, heavy industry chemical um, uh, uh, industry program where the, when the government gave Chebols all this big uh, subsidized credit. He became the CEO of that same plant, and now, and he also got his name subsequently as the guy who shapes the memory market. Um, now we don't we don't have that sort of um, um, manifestations here, and even the the thousands of Malaysians who got trained, uh, multinationals as invisible colleges that uh, drove tacit, the the production of tacit knowledge in these firms, enormous amounts, many of whom are in Taiwan and elsewhere. Now do they themselves? did not have the environment, the, the policy environment, to, to create um, these uh, leaps in technology. <coughs> Come to conclusions now. <coughs> well, Penang's, Penang's achievement in technological upgrading the IC industry has not met the heights of Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. Its success in stimulating upgrading to supportive R&D activities and the functional activities of IC design and fabrication is no less spectacular. There's nowhere else in Malaysia you have that uh, as extensively. It may prove even more noteworthy as the province had to steer carefully its strategies to work with a national framework where the federal government has, more, has been more concerned with ethnic-based equity issues in the country. Penang's experience obviously offers lessons for provinces and other locations to stimulate industrialization and technological upgrading in medium and large uh, countries. Strategic networking links 
the type of Penang, can be critical in building linkages and pathways for stimulating firm level technological upgrading. Penang's provincial framework became successful because of the potency of the productive networking evolved between the foreign MNCs and the provincial um, um, agencies and the federal government. Penang managed to convince the federal government to offer incentives to attract from abroad low value added stages of assembly and tests uh, of MNCs from 1971 until the late 1980s and from 2005 grants to stimulate functional upgrading. While foreign MNCs have indeed played a critical role in the integration and subsequent upgrading of the IC industry in Penang, the story will not be complete without a strong mention of the leadership role played by the local actors. Thank you.